Oh, uh, Mr. Stanley, you mentioned uh, colonization and inequality, and of course, politicians may uh, forget uh, that people have um, different um, characteristics, and especially we can observe this inequality in some countries where the power range is significant, and despite only 10% of population in the elitist class and have benefits from this system, why still right-winning parties are more supported in these countries in accordance with inequal circumstances? What do you think? So can you, can, why, do, why do who support right-wing country parties? Why, why right-winning uh, parties are more supported in the countries where the uh, power dis, uh, distribution are more significant and uh, uh, Economical uh, disparity is much more uh, notable. Yeah, people Actually. should aware of that, right? Right, great, great question. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> if we could solve, uh, yeah, uh, if we could, uh, uh, because because people, what happens when you have large power distinctions and you have many poor people? Is that well? Is that well? Education is extremely important here. So, if you are, that's why right wing parties always seek target the education system. In many countries, right wing parties, uh, well, it's the it's the normal thing to do. They really focus on the education system and they try to make it more nationalistic. They try to make it more focused on on myths and sort of worshiping the leader and they try to remove the kind of critical aspect of edu of an education system and they attack universities and academics as leftists and and uh and th that's what they do they focus on the education system because they don't want people to learn a full history and uh and uh so when people are less educated they're more susceptible to a kind of cultural politics. Remember the point I've been emphasizing throughout. What happens, what a tyrant does is the tyrant, the tyrant is supported by rich people and wants to be enormously rich themselves. This is a dialectic that goes back to Plato. Um, so, uh, but we see it again and again. So the poor people, if they actually focused on the people who are responsible, for them feeling terrible <laughs> and being afraid, uh, then that would be a big problem <laughs> for the tyrant. The tyrant wouldn't get elected. So the tyrant has to say uh, that they're not your problem. The problem is really that your cultural traditions are being under threat. Um, it's that your religion, your way of life is being placed under threat by people who are different than you. And so your question, and, and weirdly, as people get more poor and as people get less educated, the more that kind of politics seems to work with them, um, with the dominant group, members of the dominant group. Um, you can say to members of the dominant group, your fear is because, you see their fear and the, the fear and the anger is from is often because of poverty and because of lack of power. But people are susceptible to flattery. People are susceptible to being told your, you know, your identity is the best identity. You know, you Germans say under the Nazis, you know, the Germans are the best, and you know, and the German and and German traditions are being destroyed. And your fear and anger is because of immigration and foreigners, and in that case, in the case of Hitler, Jews. Um, although Jews are have often been blamed, but uh, the uh, you can blame it. You can blame the fear and anger on a target on a, on on a cultural target, and so. What I'm left, what I haven't answered in your question, and if I did answer it, I would be the most significant intellectual maybe ever, <laughs> is why do people place that kind of cultural politics? Why is the cultural politics so much more important to them 
than jobs, food, democracy, political power, political do they say. Need to belong some, somewhere? What? Uh, do they need to belong somewhere? What do you think? Belong somewhere, yeah. There, well, yeah. So there's a need, there, there is a, there's more of a human need for, uh, it's not that they need to belong somewhere. It's they need to, so, so Du Bois in his great 1935 book, Black Reconstruction, has this concept called the psychological wages of whiteness. And it's a very important concept for understanding politics. What he says, he's trying to explain why poor whites support wealthy whites when all poor whites have to do is join with poor black people and, you know, and then they could have more power and more money and they'd face down the rich whites and, and everyone would have a better life. Uh, so, and he's like, why didn't this happen? Why did poor whites align themselves with rich whites instead of with their fellow poor people? And he said, it's because in America, whiteness is a kind of money. It's a kind of wage. And so if you're white, then, you know, you, even if you make, if you're poor, you still feel richer than a black poor person because your whiteness you're in a country that prizes whiteness. And so you've got this extra wage and equality threatens that wage. You'll lose your advantage over black people. You have a psychological wage by being white. And so what cultural politics does is it emphasizes that psychological wage. Oh, tyrants say, look, at least your at least you're white, you know. The real threat are the black people, you know. At least you're white. I may be incredibly rich and powerful, but I'm white too. And so I'm on your side. And so I don't think it's as much a sense of belonging as much as the members of the dominant group feel that the, the only thing they have, if you're a poor member of the dominant group, the only thing you have left is your identity. And so, you feel if there's a person who isn't a member of the dominant group, they can't, they can't take, they're still inferior to you because you, you, you're a member of the dominant group. And so, so that's the weapon that tyrants use. Uh, they say, I'm not gonna give you more money, I'm not gonna give you, but I will make sure that you are always more respected than the minority group. You answered perfectly. Thank you. Thanks. Great so, professor, question. we talk about mostly the poor, poor people, poor people, but uh, on the contrast, how LT seeks to instill flawed ideology in negatively privileged group through the institution of media and the education. Uh, so, what happens with uh, so there's always a struggle over the, the media and the education system. Uh, especially any, any competent tyrant is going to try to control those two things, the media and the education system. They're going to claim that the media is filled with liberals and communists, and that universities are filled with liberals and communists, uh, and are trying, and feminists, and uh, gender ideology, and they're going to try to to seize control. They're tr going to try to say, uh, or or like as, as Hitler said, that Jews were controlling the media. So often you'll have people say some hidden group is controlling the media or the universities. That's the standard playbook of a tyrant. And so uh, so so then they try to seize those institutions, the media and the education system. And then they can tell a false narrative about the past. And a, a standard false narrative will be a way of praising, praising, giving a certain vision of the past. So this goes back to Fichte in, uh, in uh, Lectures to the German Nation, Die Adressen an die Deutsche Nation, where he says, you should set up your education system to, uh, you should set up your education system 
to praise your country, to, to create a false vision of a nation. And so what this does is it gives people a certain identity. They think, oh, our nation is great. Our nation has always been great. And, uh, and, and this leader uh, is the, the personifies this greatness. So, so it gives them a kind of thing to be proud of uh, when they don't have money or good jobs or something. And so, so uh, someone who's trying to take control of a country will want to control the media narrative. I mean, we know this, right, from North Korea, right? In North Korea, uh, from tyranny, you know, uh, North Korea, you know, the leader is uh, Kim Jong-un is, is, represent, is all the time represented in the media as a godlike figure. Um, you know, the education system tells this story of the greatness of North Korea um, with the great leader, dear leader, as the representative of the greatness. And so, so then people get an identity. They get an identity. They're like, they're proud of that. And since they're so, oh, sorry. And since they're so proud of that, uh, that, that gives them a false picture of history in the world. And it's very tough to, when people operate with a false picture, a false picture of history, a false understanding of history, or an understanding of history that is limited, that doesn't include, say, the experiences of women, uh, the experiences of minority groups, then, uh, you know, you can manipulate them uh, going into the future. So, so those are very important. So, you know, uh, the important thing with the, with the media and education system is to give people a sense that, uh, I mean, for, for, for a would-be tyrant or is to give people a false picture of history. Because if they have a false picture of history, uh, then they think they're going to be prone to thinking that, uh, you know, if they're poor, you know, they have no one to blame it on. Uh, huh. If, uh, you know, a false picture of history is a way to manipulate people their entire lives. Thank you. Well, can you explain the concept of uh, hermen hermeneutical injustice? Is it something more related with like fatalism or what from the viewpoint of proletariat? So, uh, so the, the term comes from Miranda Fricker in her book, Epistemic Injustice, a famous feminist philosopher. But the concept is very old. So there's a book by Carter G. Woodson from, I think, 1931 called The Miseducation of the Negro. He was a black intellectual. Mm -hmm. uh, and chapter nine is called Political Education Denied. And in that chapter, he talks about how white, uh, how got white governments in southern states refused to allow black schools to have copies of the Constitution. Now, why did they prevent them from having copies of the Constitution? They prevented them from having the co copies of the Constitution because they didn't want young black children to learn that the Constitution says all men are created equal. They didn't want young black children to learn about rights, the rights they had. So they wanted to rob from them the concepts they needed to understand reality. The example Miranda Fr Fricker gives, so, so, that, so that links to education, the education system. So the, uh, so the earlier, sorry, so the earlier, the, er the earlier question was how does an education system work to, uh, to prevent, to in instill ideology? Um, uh, so, uh, hold on. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so the earlier question was, how does an education system work to instill ideology? Uh, hermeneutic and hermeneutical injustice is important 
is an important feature of that, like the example I just described. If you don't give people the concepts they need to navigate the social world, then they won't understand how they're being manipulated. If you don't allow people to learn about rights and freedoms, then they won't demand their rights and freedoms. And so if you want an education system to prevent, if you want to create an education system that will, that will have a, result in a docile population, a population that won't challenge authority. Don't teach them about social movements. Don't teach them about women's history. Don't teach them about, uh, about the French Revolution. <laughs> Don't give them the concepts. And that's hermeneutical injustice. When you deny people the concepts they need in order to thrive in their social and political world.